This is a production of Cornell University. Great. Thanks so much, Nina. And good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll apologize right now for the fact that I'm going to slip out right afterwards because it's not only the busiest week of my summer field season, I'm a field corn breeder. So corn is pollinating in my breeding nursery right now. So we're pollinating like that. But it's also the week when the Empire Farm Days, the big farm expo is going on up in Seneca Falls. So my breeding nursery is in Aurora. The farm expo is in Seneca Falls. I spent the whole week driving circles around the lake from one to the other. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a really scenic area, so I enjoy it. All right. We'll get ready for the lighting tour here on this topic. Um, I titled this talk, Who Put Those Genes in My Food? Facts and myths about GMOs, and that's a bit of a nod to a talk I gave many years ago on this topic, and it was actually to a, appropriately enough to a garden club. I believe it was a ladies' garden club. They were very curious, very interested, great audience. I did my whole talk. I was feeling good about it. I got to the end, and one of the ladies raised her hands and just said very wistfully, "I just wish I could still get a tomato without jeans." <laughs> And all of you will recognize that headline, which you can find in the news that says, majority of US consumers want food labeled if it contains DNA. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work to test some of those notions. So here's what I would like to do. I want to talk a little bit about why I think this topic is controversial, because I think that helps us all inform the way we talk about it with other people. I will go through what is genetic engineering and try to put it in context of previous genetic change in our crops. I'll talk about what genetic engineering crops are out there and being grown right now, and then we'll address a few of what could be many questions and concerns. And it won't be enough time to talk about everything, but I'll hope to hit some of the ones that are relevant to this particular audience. So why the controversy? Well, when the first genetically engineered crops were grown commercially, which was in the mid-1990s, so we're going on 20 years ago now, a lot of the people involved, the industry, the seed industry, as well as the breeders, said, oh, this is just a logical extension of what plant breeders have always done. Truth is, most people have never heard of a plant breeder, right? I had not when I came to Cornell, so that tells you something. So there's very little public understanding of plant breeding. One of my colleagues, social scientist down at Rutgers, did a survey of the general public and asked this question, have you ever eaten a fruit or vegetable that is a of traditional crossbreeding? Who would like to hazard a guess on what, now we're going to do this as a survey, I'm going to make you raise your hand for what percentage of people you believe answered this question, no, in the US, general public, okay? So who thinks it was 50% of us? <laughs> no, I've never eaten fruit or vegetable. Fifty to sixty? Oh, Neil has what you think. Oh, you know. No, so, so. Oh, okay. I did say fifty percent or less. Okay, only oh, two people have prayed it. Okay, fifty to sixty? Sixty to seventy? Seventy to eighty? Eighty to ninety? More than ninety percent? Oh, you guys are pessimistic. Okay, this is how the answers came in. So, about two thirds of the people said, no, never done that. Another 11% were not sure. And a little over a quarter said yes. And this audience would recognize that the answers should look like that. And the whole line there is simply to, to make it clear that that's not just a circle, it's a pie chart. <laughs> but also to acknowledge that it's possible that there are some people who are eating all their fruits and vegetables by gathering from the wild, but rather unlikely. Unless you're doing that, Almost everything you have eaten, of course, is a product of traditional crossbreeding. Just so to tell people this is just what plant breeders have done all along did not really help. It left them saying, who? And what have they been doing to them? I would add to that that for the most part, the genetically engineered crops that are out there don't necessarily offer clear, easily recognizable benefits to consumers, perhaps to producers, perhaps to the environment. But to consumers, it's another piece of food. It doesn't look very different. Nothing that would advantage them. And like any new technology, we have concerns. We all, some portion of the population will always have concerns. 
So what is genetic engineering? Well, a new tool for breeding improved crops, which is a process that dates back to domestication. That is when humans first began thousands of years ago tinkering with the genetics of the crops we grow by choosing which seeds to save. Of course, you know, Gregor Mendel, the early breeders, and now we still do, I'm about to go to the nursery and do exactly the same these guys thing these guys did in the 1930s. Some augmented by that thing, which is the gene gun, a way to do genetic engineering. Now the best way, one of the best ways I can think of to illustrate what that difference means was something that a colleague uh, at the University of Wisconsin put together, which are these images of James Dean House at Wisconsin, art from the mid-1600s, and current day fruits or vegetables. So we looked at these old still life paintings, you know, the Dutch masters and all that. There is what a watermelon looked like in mid-1600s on the left. And on the right, of course, is a watermelon now. And you ask audiences, so, so is this genetically engineered? And everyone says, oh yes. Well, no, oh no. This is in fact simply a product of selection and breeding, traditional breeding. Which one would you rather eat? Well, of course, right? So to put this in context, yes, it is a new tool for breeding improved crops, but overlaying on a context of profound change that humans have brought about in the genetics of the crops we use for food, feed, fuel, fiber, and beauty. So that new tool is a way to change the properties of an organism by moving genes between organisms or actually changing a gene that already exists, but in a way that does not require sexual cross-compatibility. Now, I'm actually a traditional corn breeder. I go out and cross my corn with my corn. I can go out to my nursery this afternoon and pour bacteria on the corn silks, but I will get nothing from that. Genetic engineering allows me to bypass that cross-compatibility barrier to pull a gene from a bacterium and conceivably put it in a corn plant. Okay? That's where it's different. Let's do the quick review of genetic material. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the code book where all of the information you need to be you or I need to be me or corn needs to be a corn is stored. It controls the structure of the organism as well as when those products are produced. It is a code essentially written in four letters, the four base pairs that form the core of this DNA molecule. We abbreviate them A, T, G, and C. And amazingly enough, that four letter code does provide in every cell of your body all the instructions for what you need to do. Every cell in your body contains a complete copy of that code. And in that little <coughs> set of 23 molecules of DNA are all the instructions for how to be a human. Grow, reproduce, thrive, give talks at floriculture conferences, whatever it is. And shockingly enough to me, now you can tell I'm really a geneticist, this code is universal. Imagine that, a four-letter code that can code for how to be a yeast, or a petunia, or a human, or a sequoia tree, or a whale, or a virus. Every single organism uses essentially the same code. That universality is why genetic engineering works. Someone could take a gene from that bacteria and plunk it into a soybean plant, and to the soybean plant, it's just more A, T, Gs, and Cs, more instructions. So as the machinery that reads the genetic code of the soybean plant comes to that gene, it doesn't say, oops, here's something from a bacteria. All it sees is more instructions written in the same code it recognizes anyway. It would be as if Neil were writing a piece of literature and said, you know, this flower is rather dull, and he thought, that doesn't sound dramatic enough, so he cut out a piece that said, exceedingly dull, and pasted it in there. The next person that reads that is not going to say, oh, look, Neil tinkered with this. It's going to look like it was written that way all the time. Okay, to quick review, traditional crossbreeding, you cross two parents, the offspring, like their kids, have a mix of traits from the two parents. Genetic engineering, the big challenge in some ways is to find an actual gene that would be useful to have in a plant. But then by a rather complex process, you stick that gene into your plant, along with some sequences that make sure you, you, it gets expressed when and where you want it to. So a genetically engineered plant has one or a few genes added to a particular parent, as opposed to being a mix of the two parents that were crossed to make a traditionally crossbred plant. So 
genetic modification from humans go all the way back to domestication. This is my organism, this is its wild ancestor, Teosinte. Not very similar looking, are they? Farmers all over the world selected different types out of that organism, maize, to fit their particular niches. I love this set. These are things we think of as completely different vegetables. Broccoli, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. They all trace back to exactly the same ancestral mustard plant. Different people in different places selected for different edible plant parts. And the more you got of that, the more you had. So they selected the larger and larger flower heads, or leaves, or stems, or lateral buds like the Brussels sprouts. And of course, traditional crossbreeding and genetic engineering. When I say humans have profoundly altered the genetics of our crops for thousands of years, this is what I mean. It goes from farmers choosing to save seed, to farmers selecting and saving seed out of cultivated crops, to breeding that's gone on for 150 years, to genetic engineering. So what are the genetically engineered crops that are out there? Three big categories, and then a few less, uh, more newer and less commonly grown ones. First, the BT crops, which have a gene from what you probably all recognize as a, a, a bacterial insecticide, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, Solus thuricide, and a number of other things. The gene that produces a protein that inside an insect alkaline gut is converted chemically into a toxin was removed from the bacterium and put into some of these crops to make them insect resistant. You can eat the crop, you're fine, because you have an acid gut. So do all mammals and birds. Certain insects, when they eat it, they consume that protein the gene produces, and it becomes a toxin in that alkaline gut environment, and that is what controls the insect. Second big category, the herbicide-resistant crops. Most of these are Roundup ready or resistant to glyphosate, although there are other herbicide resistances coming along. Again, this is a gene from a naturally occurring soil bacteria that allows the plant to detoxify an uh, herbicide that would otherwise be toxic to it. And the third big category, the virus-resistant crops. Um, papaya and squash are the two that I know of. This is um, genetically engineered virus-resistant papaya, and this is that is not resistant, so you can see quite effective. That one is created by taking the gene that makes the protein coat of the virus. A virus is a protein coat with a little piece of genetic material inside it. That's all it is. Okay? And in that genetic material is one gene that produces the protein so the virus can make itself coats. Okay? You take the gene from the coat, not the genes that cause the plant to get diseased, you build it into the plant, and it acts essentially like what we do when we get vaccinated. It essentially vaccinates the plant against infection by that virus. So the plant produces proteins for virus, but no virus. There are a few more recently approved um, events that I wanted to talk about. Those three, the BT and the, and the herbicide resistance and the virus resistance have been around for a long time. More recently, we have new herbicide tolerances. I'll we'll talk about why in a moment. We have reduced lignin alfalfa. So this should, is uh, a crop that was developed to increase its digestibility as feed. We have the potato that's been engineered for less of this black spot bruise over here, less acrylamide production, and lake light resistance, several versions of that. And we have the non-browning apple, this one, the um, arctic apple, which you can cut and it doesn't turn brown as quickly. Now notice that these, the reduced lignin alfalfa, the potato and the apple, these are really some of the first traits that strike you as something directed at consumer quality, okay? The black spot brewery is kind of a consumer issue. The acrylamide production in potato, absolutely a consumer issue. The non-browning apple, more appealing to consumers. And the reduced lignin alfalfa, the consumers in that case are cows. Yeah. So this is CRISPR, are you talking about CRISPR? These are all traditional genetic engineering stuff. Okay, so we haven't even know. hit CRISPR yet, but I'm not sure I'll have time to today. <laughs> that will be the next one. Okay, I'll try to be fast. I wanted to talk to this audience particularly about vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals, because you know a lot of this is in the field crops or not. But there have been a series of approvals. So when you get approval to commercialize a genetically engineered version of a crop, 
you need to get approval from three agencies. The USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, in order to be sure that there's not a new pest problem created by that crop. The Environmental Protection Agency, which has to do things like label glyphosate for use on crops it would normally kill, but they're the genetically engineered resistant ones. Okay, so the EPA. And the Food and Drug Administration, which is responsible for food and feed safety. When you've got those three approvals, you get what's called deregulation or approval to commercialize that crop without special regulations. So these are, starting in 1992, all the approvals, it's just the number of approvals in a given year for things which would be considered vegetable, fruit, or ornamental. There was a big spate early on with tomato. The um, flavor saver tomato was actually the first genetically engineered crop, and lots of different versions of it were approved. And then there were a few um, squashes. Here are those virus-resistant squashes, a few potatoes here, um, the papaya, the virus-resistant papaya. And then we had kind of a desert here until pox-resistant plum, okay? Um, another papaya patent. This one right here is the blue rose, which has been approved, but I don't know that it's being used. And then another recent, this is 2014 to 2017, a recent collection that includes that new version of the potato with the reduced acrylamide, the black spot bruise, and the lake light resistance, as well as the new Arctic apple. Okay? To put that in context, I'm going to put some stars on this picture, and what the stars represent is the numbers. So this is the numbers for vegetable, fruit, and ornamentals. The stars are the numbers for field crops. So you can see they tracked fairly similarly here at the beginning, but then where the, the things that are more directly tied to consumers, vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals, dropped right off, we still had a lot of field crops activity, really a lot. And now they're sort of catching up again. So I think the public response caused the people that are producing fruit and vegetables and, and less so ornamentals, I think there's just been less work there, to back off from this technology. Because after all, we don't think of ourselves as eating corn or canola or alfalfa or cotton, but we sure know we eat potatoes and carrots and peppers and so on. So I think the consumer response from the, the fruit and vegetable industry back off. So I have about 10 minutes left. With that 10 minutes, I'm going to try and run through some questions and concerns. Yeah, question. Do you have any sense of how much it costs to get something approved? There are a lot of estimates, and the estimates vary dramatically. So if you talk to people from the really large seed industry, they will give you estimates that include millions of dollars. If you talk to Okanagan Specialty Fruit that developed the Arctic Apple, it's a very tiny company in Canada, they got a US approval, and they'll tell you a number that's in the tens of thousands of dollars. So it sort of depends on how you approach it. Right? There is a, a fair amount of paperwork involved. So it's not, it, 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 there's no world in which it's cheap and easy. Yes. So how does CRISPR play <laughs> You really want me to talk about CRISPR at all. <laughs> so I will, I will say this about CRISPR. So CRISPR is a, a technology for bringing about genetic change in a much more targeted way. And the two things it lets you do differently from traditional genetic engineering, which is cutting the gene out of this and sticking it in that, basically somewhere at random, and hoping to find one where you didn't randomly disrupt genes the plant needs to function, okay? That's genetic engineering. CRISPR allows you to target exactly where in the genetic material of that crop you want to make a change, and then either do one of two things, create random change at that spot, so you identify, perhaps, we'll use it, an example I just heard about this morning, thank you for you, flower color. You know, we know a lot about the genes that produce colors in plants. You could target that portion of a gene that causes a plant to have a particular, or a flower to have a particular color, and create random changes in that gene. A lot of them would probably give you flowers that look like mud, but every once in a while you might get one that was a really cool new color. That process, creating random change, is exactly what's happening in all of us all the time, called mutation. We all have many, many mutations, because every time your cells divide, your body has to copy your entire genetic code over, so each cell gets a copy. 
I don't know about you, but when I make copies of law and things, there are always mistakes, right? <laughs> Same thing happens with the genetic machinery. It makes occasional mistakes. Those are mutations. Those are the source, ultimately, of all the variation we have within a species. It's why all of us in this room don't look identical. We all have many small genetic differences from each other, and those trace back to copying mistakes. Most of those are not useful. But through CRISPR, you can create a faster rate of copying mistakes in a particular gene. Okay? The other thing you can do with CRISPR is a mirror image of genetic engineering. You can cause a break in a particular part of the DNA, but then give the plant a template that includes a new gene, so that when it repairs that break, it incorporates the new gene. Okay? So CRISPR can be used to do genetic engineering. It can also be used to create random change. The random change part, there is nothing you can measure on those plants that will tell you this was a result of doing CRISPR versus waiting around for a mutation to happen. So the agencies that regulate this technology are really trying to figure out what to do with that. There is nothing they can do to actually look at a plant and verify whether it was a product of CRISPR gene mutation or just natural gene mutation. So did that give you something to do? To go with? So so far the very first products of CRISPR are just emerging. So we're not we're not sure if that's going to be related to GMO or not. The USDA is struggling. They're reworking their regulations right now, and that is a key question. The European Union just this past within the past week decided that yes, CRISPR is going to be regulated as genetically engineered. So different places have different regulations, and they are all struggling with how to handle that technology right now. Okay. Yes? Um, I've had people complain about the oh, size of strawberries. They don't taste the same. You know, but strawberries aren't on your list. They're not genetically engineered. Nothing commercialized is genetically engineered. So yeah, people are very quick to say, oh, it's all those GMOs. Right? Part of my point with showing you the list was there are not that many crops. And in the world of fruits and vegetables, sweet corn, green and yellow summer squash, papaya, what am I forgetting now? Tomato. Tomato, there are no current genetic engineered tomatoes. They were approved and then they were pulled from the market. Oh, that's right. Flavor Saver was a great tomato, but they did the genetic engineering on the tomato that didn't taste very good and didn't really work for growers. <laughs> They sort of forgot about, you know, they got the one gene really right, and then there's 30,000 other genes in the tomato that also need to work for people. <laughs> they forgot that part. So are, are people going to start, um, obviously, the problem started with them putting salmon gene into a strawberry and put that. Um, but are people going to be more acceptable if you use only the genes that are in that actual species and just move them around or remove or add them? And that will be not yeah, so that's that's one of the things that people are debating now. You know, would it be more acceptable to people if you just use, for example, a CRISPR to create variation within the species rather than reaching beyond those boundaries? I think, you know, my own sense is there are people for whom that will be reassuring. You know, it's not like I'm accidentally consuming something from a bacteria when I thought I was just eating food. And never mind that in nature, that does happen as well. Bacteria and viruses, as we know, can insert their genetic material into you, me, and everything yeah, else, that right? Sound and that strawberry, you're going to have a lot of trouble being. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's stuff, but it's not the end of it. That's not on market. <laughs> I also don't think it worked that well. But, um, so I think there are people who would be reassured by that. And then there are people who will just think, oh, now they're taking this technology I didn't like and they're putting it in products where I can't even tell. You know, there's, it's, it's like even more clandestine than it was. So, you know, I'm not quite sure how that will shape out. So, you know, I'm just going to say, I'm, I'm happy to just keep answering questions at this point, if that works for you. And then you get five more minutes because I started late. Well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll take Sorry, you're later, but you know, the question over here. Yeah. Do you know if the BT crops are affecting the, the bee population? The bee population? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, bees are not one of the insects that is affected by the Bacillus thuringiensis. So consequently, that protein doesn't really affect bees either. That's one of the reasons people really like it, both as an organic insecticide, as a conventional insecticide, and as a genetically engineered trait, is its, its action spectrum is pretty narrowly confined to the Lepidopterans, the caterpillars, okay. and the beetles. And different PTs work differently, uh, differentially well on particular species of caterpillars and beetles as well. I did see Bill and now I'm coming to you. I have to, I have to respect him a little. Well, a little. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so yeah. I, I guess what I was wondering about is that there's a great lack of understanding of all of this, and there's a lot of emotion in it. And so what, what does Cornell do to address that? Because I, I think at Cornell we have people who are absolutely pro-GMO, and I think there's a lot of people who are probably absolutely against it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we could all do, but does, does Cornell have uh, programs that, 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 that interpret this and extend it out? I mean, can you comment on those issues? Yeah, that so on? there are a variety of people around Cornell who do uh, speaking, publishing, educating. You know, our role is educational, so I sort of see our role as to help people understand the technology and what both its risks and its, its benefits and its risks are, because there are a lot of people who will talk about only one or only the other. Our job is not to pick sides, but to help people understand it so they can make a better informed choice of their own. I think the other thing that is part of our responsibility here is to be as forethoughtful as we can about where the hazards might lie. So I say that as, as scientists, you know, and I, it comes back to me because, again, I was speaking to an audience, I think it was up in Canandaigua, about genetically engineered crops and food safety, which is always a big concern to people. Uh, since I'm not going to get to those slides, I'll just say right now that scientifically there's no evidence of any of the commercialized genetically engineered crops having um, risks related to food or feed safety. But a woman rose, uh, put her hand up, <laughs> rose her hand, maybe that rose is on the right hand, raised her hand, and at the end and said, so how do we know this isn't the next trans fats? And you know, it's, it's a really good question because we've had a history of many, of many examples of things that were developed because people fully believed they were going to be better for us. You know, what about the ozone layer? You know, we didn't realize CFCs were destroying that. We just knew they were really good at refrigerants. Right? So sometimes things take time to find. So I would just say our, as scientists, it's also our obligation to have a certain degree of humility and a huge degree of forethoughtfulness to see as best we can where the problems might lie and try to keep on top of them. That said, you know, you all should also know nobody funds research that will examine unintended consequences. <laughs> you are never going to get that kind of funding. So how to do that in a practical sense is not easy. You have to. Yeah, I was wondering about the allergies. Yeah, so the, there, there is the FDA in their examination of data looks quite carefully at potential allergenicity. And they have, they know a fair amount about that because we know, you know, with, with major allergens, we sort of know what kind of structures and, and families of chemicals have a tendency to be allergenic. The other thing they do is um, they always look at data for in vitro, so in a petri dish, rate of breakdown with human digestive enzymes. And the argument there is if it breaks down any more slowly than any other normal protein that you would find, that's a red flag. Simply because the longer something is in your digestive system, the more chance you have to have any kind of a reaction to it, whether it's allergenic or just irritation, right? So things that break down any more slowly get red flagged, and they will not be approved until that is examined and understood. So that's, you know, the, the, the allergenicity question, I think, is handled probably the best we can with that, because the only way to really know that there is no human on the planet who would have an allergic reaction is to test every human, because we are all different. And that's not practical, but, you know, looking at a some range of human digestive enzymes and how quickly things break down is probably the best approach we can take. <coughs> you, and then I see them all the time. Yeah. 
And then the next plan, would that still be considered? So let me, let me ask, uh, when you say you, would, you get to a sterile, you know, in my world we don't get to sterile. <laughs> Maybe it's an ornamental thing. <laughs> but um, we, we do get to hybrids that don't propagate true. You know, they, they, you can save the seed and it'll grow, but it's a mess, right? I know there are also sterols, particularly in the ornamentals world, because they flower more. They're desperately trying to make seeds, so they just keep flowering. <laughs> so you said you can breed two sterols. Um, there is, and, and that's genetically controlled. The sterile traits are genetically controlled. So you could absolutely, both by breeding or by genetic engineering, change that. Okay? We don't yet have a good way of making hybrids for the truth. That, you know, strangely enough, the seed industry doesn't do a lot of research on that. <laughs> <coughs> the rest of us don't have a big research question. <laughs> I guess it's you, John. <laughs> um, this is probably not a perhaps your area of expertise, but in one else, the no needs. But the potential here to develop new colors, new shapes, new, you know, new all kinds of things. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't going to say disease for insect resistance, but yes, there's that. Anyway, um, uh, just, I mean, the whole thing, the reason people buy plants is for their appearance, their color, and that's what gives them value. We can do a lot of different things, potentially, with genetic engineering. Will consumers buy them if they know they're genetically engineered? You know, you guys could probably answer that better than I can. Um, I don't know, and I don't know how to answer that question until someone gets something approved that they actually want to try. My understanding of the blue rose is that it isn't really that great a color, and so it really hasn't taken off, right? But I would also say that there's a lot of scope for breeding lots of different colors through traditional breeding. And I would finally say, I'm surprised Marjorie can keep you under the table because insects and plants and plant pathogens love to eat one of us. But they're not going to object. Yeah. I can add John's question a little bit. But, you know, we get a lot of questions at the retail level about organic. Is this organic? Is this organic? We don't get it so much with flowers. We get it a lot. I'm sure. Yeah. But um, I, very few people actually we seem to care, based on the questions that we've been talking about, that the, the geraniums or their, or their marigolds were organically produced. I, I, I rarely, rarely get that question. So that might work the same in genetic engineering. A lot of people, by the way, think that, that organic, that, that, you know, they confuse the terms all the time. Well, and it is, it is confusing because if it's, so here's the intersection. If it is certified as organic, it must be grown from a non-genetically engineered variety, along with many other requirements. But that is true. That is true. Um, but the fact that it's not genetically engineered does not automatically make it organic. Right? So the other way it doesn't quite work. But you know, there's a lot of terms out there, and they're confusing. And I have to say, it doesn't surprise me that people are more concerned about what they're putting in their mouths than what they're looking at in their front garden. What they're looking at in their front garden, they want for beauty, but it's not going to affect their health unless they're planting ragweed or something. Yeah. So, so I think there's, that that's perhaps not a surprising reaction. And it does, it, it's made me wonder for a long time about genetic engineering and ornamentals, because I think that would be an area where there would be less concern. The original proof of concept was in ornamental. It was a uh, pine tree, and they engineered it with, um, it, it never was marketed, it never even necessarily got to a plant, I don't know, but um, they engineered it with the gene from the firefly, mm -hmm. the luciferase gene, and if the luciferase gene in the firefly has the right chemical to work on, it will produce light. So they built that gene into the pine tree, and if you watered it with the right chemical, luciferin, the tree would light up. <laughs> that was actually the original proof of concept on <laughs> So Neil, three hands up. Should I stop with you? Three, one, two, one. You were first. You're in. I was just saying, the problem with the market is the market's not there. Just like the pesticides, how ag is all the chemicals first, and we don't get that for the labels. I mean, no one's going to spend a billion dollars to develop a new petunia because they're not going to get a return on it. Yeah. 
So it's just the money's not there, so that's why it's not going to happen. Because we don't have any ornamentals to live, we need food to live. So I mean, it's. You may, you may not be right. I will say, as in closing, that the USDA at least is reevaluating and getting comments on their regulatory approval process right now. So at least that process they're hoping to streamline. That doesn't reduce what the cost of the actual genetic engineering is, which is, you know, it's not $10. Well, Although I mean, Christmas is getting cheaper. That's getting cheaper, but there's the registration cost, or so there's the development cost. Right. So those aren't going to change. But um, the, the new technology, the CRISPR that they're so interested in, will probably make the cost of the and the genetic change part cheaper. But there's all the other breeding, you know, the other thirty thousand genes in the plant to be done. Thank you. Please. I'm sorry. I can share slides with you for the rest of it. If, or you have oh, right. I slides on our greenhouse slides. Right. Then you know the answer to the question. <laughs> In a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.